All right, let's go ahead and get started with our next talk. Um, so next up um, is Keith Turner. Um, Keith is a software engineer with Peterson. Uh, Keith has been a uh, very, very long time Accumulo uh, contributor. Um, so Keith's been on the PMC probably since the beginning, I'd imagine, right? Um, so Keith's gonna talk about uh, writing applications uh, in Apache Fluo. So, Keith? Good afternoon. Um, so I'm gonna talk about tips for writing Fluo applications. And these tips are based on our experience trying to write uh, a Fluo application called Web Index. And a lot of the lessons learned, we rolled into code as a project called Fluo Recipes to kind of make a lot of, take a lot of these things we learned and make them useful in a project that um, builds on top of Fluo itself. So if you're interested in knowing about the name, the name Fluo, Eric Newton, I don't know if he's here. I know he was here earlier. He, he picked the name out, and it means drip in Latin, and you'll see why that makes sense in a little bit. And the reason we went with the color scheme is because we, when we were evaluating that name and we went and did a Google search for Fluo, the first thing that showed up was something called fluorescent parties. And it's like, I guess people, I guess people put on bright colors and then they go to a party where there's black lights and this, this is like a thing. So we, we use that for the, um, that's why the, the colors are fluorescent in the logo. And Mike Walsh and Christopher Tubbs created, Christopher Tubbs created the logo. And you'll notice it has the little water drop in it. So the F is also kind of like a faucet. So I thought that was pretty neat. So if you haven't heard of it, Fluo is based on something called Percolator from Google. And the reason Google created Percolator, their use case was to lower the latency for when things would be searchable. So uh, Google had you know, terabytes of crawl data coming in every day and their copy of the web was petabytes of data. So what they used to have to do is they would take the terabytes of new data, run hundreds of MapReduce jobs to rebuild their index of the web, and then put that in their query systems to make it available for query. So that meant excluding how, how long the crawl time took. But once the crawler crawled a document, it wouldn't be available for search for at least three days. So with Percolator, they lowered that latency from days to minutes and they could do incremental updates on their petabytes of data and have it continually kind of, continually have data percolating through and popping out the other side and up, continually updating their index of the entire web. So what Fluo offers and what Percolator offers are kind of, to a user, are three things. So Fluo is a layer on top of Accumulo. It builds on top of the Accumulo API. And it also has some custom iterators. We've heard a lot about iterators today. What it offers to a user is snapshot isolation. And that gives you the ability to see data from transactions that have only, only you only see data from committed transactions when you read the, the a Fluo table. It provides cross row transactions, which allow you to make writes across multiple nodes on an Accumulo cluster and either all of the writes go through or none of them go through. And if there's another transaction running, it'll never see like the partial writes from another transaction. It'll either see everything another transaction wrote or nothing another transaction wrote. <clears throat> and transactions are correct in the face of faults. And something I'll be talking about later is collisions. And that's when two transactions try to write to the same thing. When that happens, one transaction will fail. We call that a collision. We want to try to minimize those. So we have snapshot isolation, cross-row transaction. The other thing that a user would use is something called observers. And observers are user-provided code that can execute a transaction and they get triggered by a change. So if one transaction writes to a certain column, that can trigger an observer to run later and it'll run a, it can run a, um, another transaction and it will be told which column was modified. And the observers, kind of Google's model is that you run hundreds of instances of observers on each node, and they're all executing transactions. So if I had 20 nodes, 
I would be, at any given time, be running like 2,000 transactions to constantly be changing my data incrementally. And this is kind of a picture of, of what Fluo looks like running on a system. So each Fluo application has an associated table and you have Fluo clients that are writing data into that table, that's new data, and then those are triggering observers to kind of make changes as you're going through. And currently Fluo supports running the worker processes, that's what runs um, the observers that the user provides in Yarn. And Fluo also has something called an Oracle that's run in Yarn, and as a user you don't really need to know about that until Fluo breaks. So. Given that it's brand new, you'll probably have to, if you try to use it, you'll probably have to poke at it. But that's also running yarn, and that's just a process that gives out ever-increasing timestamps, and it's used for transactions, coordination. So one thing we did, and we'll see how this works out. We decided to split this project off of Fluo called Fluo Recipes, and it's something I don't know what the bad parts are, but I know what the good things about doing this are. So with Accumulo, over the years we've had things like when we added Lexicoders, we added that in Accumulo 1.6, but Lexicoders could have been used by any ver previous version of Accumulo. But for users, they weren't available until 1.6 came out. But if you were writing code against Accumulo 1.4, you could have still used Lexicoders. They would have been useful. Basically, Lexicoders built on top of Accumulo's API but they didn't offer any new core functionality. So we're kind of going with recipes. We're gonna put things that don't offer new functionality, they're just useful code for anyone who might be using Fluo. We're gonna put that in Fluo recipes and that can have a different release cadence. So if we wanna release Fluo recipes faster and you know we can get features out that aren't new core features but just new useful code out that would be useful to everyone faster. And some examples of some of the things, and we're gonna talk about these as the talk goes, some of the examples of what Fluo Recipes provides are the collision-free map, and that's a mechanism for doing many-to-many -many updates. Kind of like what you would normally do with MapReduce, so you're doing, joining a large data set. And one of the things we did with the web index application is we do, we invert, uh, we do, we invert the links to count inbound links, so you're kind of doing a self-join of uh, web page data. Um, the export queue is, is something we're going to talk about a good bit. That's something you use to get data out of Fluo to update external query systems. Um, the recording transaction is just, it's a transaction layer that records everything you do and you could use that to record what a transaction does and maybe put it on an export queue to export it. And some of the other things we're going to talk about that Fluo Recipes provides are transient ranges and I'll explain what that means later in table optimizations. And some of the things that it provides also don't just build on the Fluo API, they build on the Cumulo API just to make things easier. So this kind of shows a, an example abstract Fluo application where you have Fluo clients, they're feeding data into two input data sets. So you could assume one of those could be like web pages and maybe one of those could be like Twitter data or something like that. And then, uh, then there are observers that, as clients add data to those, that triggers observers to run other transactions, which will, can create derived data sets. And then eventually you may, that may trigger something which will export to an external system. So remember that I mentioned that everything you store in a Fluo application is stored in a single Accumulo table. And when Fluo applications execute their transactions, they execute something called conditional mutations, which in Accumulo, that's where you say, oh, I want to change this data at this row, but before you make the change, do a check. And what Accumulo does is it'll lock the row, it'll do the check that you asked for, and in Fluo's case, it will actually run custom iterators when it does that check. It's trying to, to it does a two-phase commit for its transactions and it uses the conditional iterators to check the conditions of the two-phase commit. But that's CPU intensive, so if your data is not spread evenly, as I'm showing in the example here, so I have the data in my table and it's spread unevenly, then I'm gonna end up, transactions are gonna end up executing conditional mutations on a subset of the tablet servers, 
and your utilization of your cluster is going to be low, or much lower than it, sh than it could be. You may have like one node, one or two nodes running at 100% CPU, while the other ones are like 30%. <clears throat> I don't know if you guys can read this, but I'll read the, the bottom of the Far Side cartoon. It says, I've got it too, Omar, a strange feeling like we've just been going in circles. Now, I didn't, when I first looked at this, as I, when I was doing what every good dad should do and reading the far side to my kids, I noticed that, you know, th there were big guys on one side and small guys on the other. I did notice that not only are there small guys on one side, there's only three of them, and there's four big guys. So one of my kids pointed that out to me. I was like, oh, that's, just, that's really unbalanced. So one thing Accumula Recipes does is it provides some mechanisms to help you get data spread evenly. So these input data sets, um, you want to spread each one of them evenly across the tablet servers so that your computation is even, the computation associated with executing transactions. And this just shows what I was talking about earlier, that you, when you run Fluo, you're going to have many observers executing transactions in parallel. And this shows the best case scenario where they're all kind of reading and writing to the tablet servers evenly. So you get um, even utilization. So the, the balancing that Fluo Recipes provides is based on, um, it's some code on top of something in Accumulo 1.7 called the regex group balancer. So Fluo Recipes takes that and makes it easy to configure it. And it also provides a way to register ranges and say, oh, I want you to balance this range. And other recipes and Fluo recipes build on that, where they just say, oh, here's some ranges I want you to balance. And then there's this utility code that will configure the accumulo table and make it and set up the regex group balancer to get that nice, even spread of data. Now, even if you spread your data evenly, you may still have some hotspots. That's one of the things that I found and I think everyone finds when you're working with real data. So the, the web index application was working with common crawl data, which is, it's, I, I forget the organization that produces that data, but it's, it's on Amazon S3, it's petabytes of data from, from a nonprofit organization that just crawls the web. So you have as much real data as you want. And when you start dealing with real data, I, at first I had a schema where I had something like P for page, so one of the ways I would part, so in Fluo, all the data is in one table, so you kind of need to partition these different data sets, and I usually just do that with a row prefix. So it would have p colon com dot example slash popular link. And if you have a popular domain, it can end up, you can end up executing a lot more transactions against that part of the Fluo table, and you get uneven utilization. So a simple solution was to add a hash, and I created a recipe for this, but you know, you wouldn't, you don't really need a recipe just to add a hash to a row. But the recipe does a few other things that kind of make it, that are still kind of simple, but if everyone has to implement them, they're gonna spend a, a few days working on this. It'll generate, automatically generate table splits for your hashed range, and will automatically generate the balancing config to get that range evenly balanced across the tablet servers. So earlier I mentioned collisions, and I want to talk about with WebIndex, or give a real example of where this occurs. So like I was saying, WebIndex would compute the inverted index count. So what it would do is conceptually, for a given web page, when, um, when the Fluo application saw a web page change, what it would do is it would figure out, okay, I have the new copy of the web page and the old copy. It would figure out the new links and the removed links. So for the new links, it would go get their current count and add one and then write that back out. For the removed links, it would get the current count, subtract one and write that back out. And this is kind of a picture that shows that. If I have two, two observers doing that in parallel, they're both executing transactions. If at around the same time, they both try to update the same URL, one of them is going to fail. And this can get really bad. Like if I had an observer that had written to say, a thousand rows, and then it collides with another transaction. The, the thousand that it had kind of gotten down, they kind of all need to be rolled back, and that's expensive. It's okay if that happens every once in a while, but if that's happening all the time, 
it's going to kill your throughput. So in the Google paper, one of the things they mention is one way to deal with this is use something called weak notifications. And notifications are a way to signal that you want an observer to run. And weak notifications are notifications that are kind of outside of transactions. They have another type of notification called a strong notification, and it will collide. Weak notifications will not collide. So use weak notifications and break your processing up into two observers. So, so what I'm going to do now, instead of reading the current count for the link and incrementing it, I'm just going to queue up that, oh, this web page has a new outbound link. So I want you to increment the inbound count for that link. I just queue up a plus one for that. And then queue up a minus one for the removed links. And this kind of shows how that looks in a picture. Where I have observers processing documents. They're queuing up plus ones, minus ones. And then I have other observers that will go read all the queued up plus ones and minus ones for, um, for a URL. The way Accumulo works is you have you have a table, and a table is broken down into tablets, where a tablet's a range of data. And within a tablet, you have a set of files. So let's just say that I have, I have this tablet, and it has, some, it has three keys in it, plus a bunch of other keys, and that's stored in one large file right now. And then some updates come in, and eventually Accumulo will do something called, we call a minor compaction. It'll write those out to another file. And then my observer comes along and it processes the updates and computes the new values. Now since Accumulo has a, each tablet has a list of immutable files, you can't delete the data and the existing files. What you do is write out delete markers. And those delete markers will not go away until you compact all the files into one. Now the way Accumulo naturally works is it doesn't like compacting your largest file. So it may compact, assume that the two files on the right are two small files, it may compact those into one. And it will drop the deleted data, but the delete markers will still be hanging around in the file. So if I have this pattern where I'm constantly queuing up updates and then deleting them, queuing up updates and then deleting them, eventually these delete markers are gonna build up. It's gonna force me to have to do a full compaction to get rid of them, which is really expensive. So I would like to avoid that. So one simple way to avoid that is something, um, I kind of talked about this, well, not partially. So one way to avoid that is, is to put your update data in a different range of the table. Kind of like here. So we have our derived data set A, which is created by transactions acting on the things happening with the input data sets. And the updates for the derived data set are going to go in a different range of the table. And Accumulo supports compacting a range of the table, not the whole table. So what you can do is put these updates in different ranges, and then you can compact those separately without compacting the whole table. And that gives you the full compaction, which makes the delete markers go away. And also those ranges of update data, you want to balance those evenly across the cluster also. Because you're going to have your lots of transactions queuing up updates, and then eventually you're going to have transactions pulling updates out and deleting them, and then updating the derived data set. And Fluo Recipes has a, a mechanism to help make this easier. It has a, it, I give this concept a name, I call it transient data. And Fluo Recipes has a, a registry of transient ranges. And then it has a utility where you can just periodically compact the transient ranges. And the collision-free map recipe, it kind of implements this. It generalizes this pattern of having two observers and an update queue. And it makes it easy to write code that follows that pattern. So as a user of the collision-free map, you would implement two functions, a combiner, like a MapReduce combiner that, and combiners in MapReduce, you never see if, you know if you're seeing all the data, and that's just the same here. You always, combiners should always work on a subset of the data and, and squish it down. And then, so a user provides a combiner and um, an update function. 
or a function that gets notified when a value is updated, and it tells the new and old value. So for like a URI inbound link count, that function would be called when the inbound link count changed, and it might say, oh, for example.com slash foo, the inbound link count went from 50 to 60. And that's the type of thing that you may want to export. That's an example. So if, you, if you're actually creating an application like we did with Web Index, where you could query um, for a domain and ask what links in that domain have the most inbound links, then Fluo can actually update that index you're building incrementally by exporting that data. Now, exporting data from uh, Fluo can be tricky if you don't do it right. So it kind of created a recipe for that. And even if you don't use the recipe, it's good to be uh, familiar with the concepts behind the recipe. So this kind of shows the, depending on your situation, this could be okay in some situations, but this shows what's probably the wrong way to export data. So if you're, if you're in a transaction like where you're computing the, the link counts, and you export the data in the middle of why you're doing that, if that transaction fails, when it starts again, it may compute something different. But the export, it may have done the export before it failed. So what this table is trying to show is it's showing that, okay, I have one transaction that committed and it exported old value nine, new value 13. And then I had a transaction that exported old value 13, new value 17, it, the transaction didn't commit. For some reason it failed before committing, so, but you've told the external system, here's an old and new value. Now if the external system is always deleting the old value, then it will be left with a dangling um, 17 that will never get deleted. Because the when something, when an observer comes back and reruns the transaction, it will not, the new value will be 21 this time. So the 17 won't be deleted, and the old value will be 13. So ideally, the old value would be 17 so that it could do something, like delete the old value. So one solution to this is only export committed data. So when you're computing something in Fluo that you want to export, whatever is doing the computation of that should fully do the computation and write to a queue within Fluo what it wants to export. And that way, if that transaction fails, the way Fluo works, if the transaction was writing all over the table and to the export queue, either all of that goes through or none of it goes through. So that way you'll get um, consistently computing what's on the export queue. So the, Fluo, the way the Fluo recipe export queue works is as a user, you would add key values to it. And you would provide a function that gets a list of key value sequence number, where the sequence number is computed by the export queue recipe and is guaranteed to increase. And the sequence number is useful for the external system because the, the transactions processing the exports, they can fail. They can export things multiple times. But when they do, the sequence number can, can help with that. And I'll, have, I'll talk about that a little bit on the next slide. And the export queue, it automatically does some of the things I've been talking about previous, previously, like balancing, configures transient ranges, splits the table so that the data spreads. So this just shows an example of using the export queue. So a user in their track, in their transaction where they compute something, would queue it up on the export queue. And this shows an example of what I was talking about, that an export observer could, something that's doing, running an export transaction could fail. So, but when it fails, it's guaranteed to kind of regenerate the same thing. So the receiving system has to be able to um, deal with duplicate and out of order data, but it's always gonna get the same data. And the sequence numbers can help with that, especially if like, if you're exporting to an index in Accumulo, you can use the sequence numbers, the time stamp in Accumulo. And then if you get out of order data, out of order data it will naturally sort behind any newer data. 
And of course, the um, export queue should be evenly spread across your cluster. And that's the recipe does that, so you don't have to worry about it. So this concept is, is kind of interesting. I gave it a name, I call it invert on export, but when I was first trying to write applications for Fluo, I had this, I wanted to try to build the index I ultimately wanted in the Fluo table. But I came to the realization that that's unnecessary. What I need to do is compute the information I'm interested in indexing in Fluo. When it exports, it can possibly invert that information to actually index it. So an example would be, it's what WebIndex does. WebIndex answers these three questions. For a domain, which page has the most inbound links? For a page, how many inbound links does it have? And for all pages, which has the most inbound links? Now those three questions can be answered from the inbound links by taking the inbound links you compute in Fluo and indexing them in three different ways. So what Fluo does is on export, so this is an example like when Fluo computes that the inbound links for URI1 changes from 90 to 115, it's gonna delete everything with 90 because that's at the beginning of the row in the sort order and then it's gonna insert the information related to 115. So Fluo computed one piece of information and then at export time, it did five updates to Accumulo to update three different indexes. Let's see if this works. This is an example. Of running web index for three days. And what I did was the, the entire time it was running, I would query one um, domain and take a screenshot like every six seconds or something. And I took all those screenshots and put them together in a video. So this just kind of shows that Fluo is, I think it's processing like a thousand pages per second, about 12,000 links per second. And it's just constantly going through those. And updating that index that I was querying. And if Fluo had ever dropped the ball, like if it didn't delete one of the counts when it inserted, you would see a link show up twice. And, oh, I think I'm out of time. I'm gonna hurry through these. So this is not something in Fluo recipes. This is just something you need to be aware of when writing Fluo applications. And this is kind of something bleeding through the abstraction layer. So Fluo is an abstraction layer on top of Accumulo. But as one of the things I've been mentioning is it uses conditional mutations for transactions. Conditional mutations lock rows in tablet servers. So if you have transactions, and what this is showing is I have multiple transactions, they're running concurrently. They're making updates to the same row, but different columns. They won't collide, the transactions will run fine. But one thing that can happen is that those rows, um, since they're making updates to the same row, the, on the tablet server it's gonna lock that row. So the transactions can end up waiting on each other, and the more Concurrent transactions you have trying to update the same row, the more um, wait time you're gonna have and the lower utilization you'll have on your cluster for or throughput and lower throughput. So one simple way to get around this is just to change your schema. So instead of, this just shows a, 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 an example graph schema where in one schema you have the node, a node in the row and a node in the column, and another schema you put both of the nodes in the row. Um, one thing, it, when I first started trying to write applications for Fluo and, and just trying to think about how you would write applications for Percolator, you start wondering how much work a transaction should do. And basically, some basic tips are everything a transaction does has to fit in memory. Um, you want to lower the probability of collisions. So those are reasons to do less work in a transaction. Some of the reasons you may want to do more work in a transaction is to minimize the total number of seeks that the system's doing, and to avoid recomputing data. We just released Fluo 1.0. We haven't updated the website yet, so we haven't made the announcement, but we just did that last week. It got through the incubation vote. 
We hope to release, uh, release Fluo Recipes 1.0 soon. Um, and for the 1.0 versions of Fluo, we plan to follow, Fluo and Fluo Recipes, we plan to follow Simber. If anyone's here tonight, we just posted something on the website called a Fluo Tour. It's a guided, it's a self-guided set of steps that you can go through to learn Fluo. And if anyone wanted to try that, I would be there at the hackathon tonight to help you if you had problems. And we move to Apache. And thanks if anyone has questions. <laughs> <laughs>